coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. So she had the um, diverticulosis. So it started helping her with that. It also started helping her with her depression and her anxiety. Mm. Um, And she had had those issues since she was, you know, a teenager. Um, And here she is now, you know, she just turned 31. At the time when we put her on it, she was 29. So um, it was just amazing to see the huge difference that that happened in her uh, and my clients, you know, so I was like, okay, there is definitely something to this. I need to do it. If I'm going to have my clients do it, I need to do it. So I just set out to do it for 30 days. And here we are, you know, 650, 60 days later. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was five, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed certified nutrition coach, Kate Kressinger. We discuss Kate's healing process, her journey into carnivore eating, along with her morning and workout routine, how carnivore saved her daughter's health, Kate's race across America, and her one tip to get your body back to what it once was. I really enjoyed my interview with Kate. I know you will too. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the interview. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin and I have Kate Kressinger on, certified nutrition coach. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Brian. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, excited to have you on. And uh, we got a lot to talk about today. I think we have a lot in common, uh, just looking over your website and stuff. But before we get into that, perhaps give the audience just a background into how you got into nutrition coaching. And I know you had uh, some health struggles yourself that led you uh, down this path as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's ever a short story to tell, but (laughs) I'll kind of give you a quick overview. Um, So yeah, I I definitely had some health issues myself and a lot of it came down to um, just gut healing the gut kind of thing and finding what worked for me. And, um, and like we talked about off on offline, I went to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, um, IIN for short, and started my healing process that way. And uh, lo and behold, um, my my husband is a chiropractor and he would do his workshops at his office and he always covered nutrition as well. And he said, you know what? You should just start doing my nutrition workshops. And so when I started doing that, a lot of his patients started asking, well, do you work with people? And I was like, you know what? I could, I really could. And so I started doing that and found that that was really my passion. And I found, and and I think you find this in yourself too, that the more we help people, we heal ourselves as well. And um, so it was kind of, you know, almost kind of, I don't want to say a, um, a selfish kind of way of doing it, but it was, it definitely helped me because I kept on top of all that stuff and the latest and the greatest and learning more. Um, and so that's how I became a nutrition coach is, is that way. Yeah. I always say the best way to learn is to teach. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I, I coach clients in health, but I also coach some golf. And oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> so I coach high school golf. So Yes. I might have to ask you for some help on that too, because I don't know how to golf. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and, I mean, I could talk an hour about golf. I won't get into it. But I will say that when you do, when you're telling these 15 year old kids, uh, you know, different things about the mental game of golf and getting better at it, it's like it so- helps solidify it in your own golf game. So, yes, yeah. yeah, teaching definitely, whether it's health or golf or whatever, is the best way to learn. Absolutely. I agree. And I find that a lot of the messages I was giving my, my clients and my husband's patients were things I needed to hear too. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of hard to take, right? When you're, you're, it's easy to, to do that for somebody else, but when you have to do it for yourself, it's, it's kind of hard. We're like our, our own worst critics, number one, but we're also our own worst patients and clients. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I I hear you. And (laughs) and, uh, before you got us, before you became a certified nutrition coach, uh, I know we were talking a little offline. uh, You worked for Pfizer. I'm just curious how that experience sort of led you down becoming a health coach. Yeah. So that is, is another big reason too. Um, So I, when I worked for Pfizer, um, which I don't like to admit often just because of the damage that it does for people like the pharmaceuticals do. And um, so, yeah, I worked with them right out of college. Uh, I knew a couple of 
a handful of people actually that worked for Pfizer. And so before I even graduated college, I had a job and, um, which I, I thought was great because I was a single mom at the time I was, you know, going to school full time, raising the kids by myself and working full time. Like, why wouldn't I want to have something that was that glamorous as far as money for, for kids. Right. Cause I had my school loans to pay off. And then I had two kids that were shortly going to be going to college too. And obviously to put a roof over their head and, you know, to support them. So I was like, well, why wouldn't I want to do this? And those jobs at the time, and they probably still are because they're sales positions paid a lot of money. And mm -hmm. so I went into it blind, um, you know, and, and not knowing too much. So when I, when I started working there, I always had Lipitor. Um, so it was a cardiovascular, it was a statin. Um, and I was very passionate about that because my dad had had two heart attacks before the age of 50. Uh, it actually runs in our family. Um, you know, I'm a big believer now that it doesn't, it's not necessarily our, our end all be all. If it's in our family, we have control over our genes and we have control over what we put into our body. And, and, um, at the time I didn't believe in, in that fully. And so I thought, you know, yeah, why wouldn't I want to sell Lipitor? It's the number one drug. Um, it's the number one company to work for. Everybody knows the name. Um, and, you know, I believed that the studies that they were showing were accurate until they started teaching it to us and telling us, you know, not to pay attention to the number needed to treat, which is the number we need to really be looking at. And the biggest studies were like the NHAN study and um, the Framingham study, which are still ongoing. And those are the ones that they use for um, the statins and why they want to take care of the LDLs first, and um, which is totally wrong and um, the wrong way of looking. It's the old school way of looking at things. And so it was kind of hard. Um, those, the, the five to seven, I think it was seven years actually that I worked for them. It was hard because I was a single mom and I needed the money and that's what was putting the roof over my kid's head. But then I had this internal battle of finding um, that the stuff that they were having us say wasn't accurate. Mm -hmm. And that was really hard for me because I'm all about getting people healthy. Um, even back then, um, if you look at the package insert of Lipitor, it was diet and exercise first. And a lot of my physicians that I called on said, you're the only one that says that. And that was the only way that made me feel good to sell that drug um, was diet and exercise first. And I was always into working out and um, so I was a big proponent of that anyway, regardless, I used to be a, um, um, an instructor, I did aerobics, and I also did a personal trainer. So that was always something I was passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it made me feel good to sell it that way. But when we started really digging into the studies and the things that they told us to stay away from, and not to say, um, really started questioning, what was I doing? Why am I doing this? Um, you know, especially where my dad had to be on a statin. And I was like, whoa, you know, he shouldn't be first off, he should be looking at his diet and exercise. And right. so that was a big, big um, indicator as to why I also kind of do what I do now as far as nutrition, because I'm a big believer in changing all that through what we eat and what we put on our body and in our body. So yeah. And, uh, and so that led to you down the path of I know you've had some health issues yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, just looking like migraines and chronic pain and food allergies, and it led you into becoming carnivore. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so I tried everything and I, I think, um, I'm a big on keeping an open mind and, you know, listening to what people have to say. Um, I'm big at trying things out. I'm a big believer in nothing is the same for everybody. Um, so I'm a big believer in, in you doing that N equals one, you know, you need to see what works for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I tried everything and anything. I mean, I've always been someone that really didn't like meat and it was more texture. It wasn't because of, it was an animal. It was just because the way it felt in my teeth. I always struggled with that growing up. Um, so I always leaned more towards the, the vegetarian side of things and eating vegetarian and then I was your normal, you know, vegetarian that I've always call a carbitarian. So I would eat a lot of carbs and mm. the carbs I would eat would be like the beans and the rice. Um, the ones that were supposed to be healthier for you. I wasn't that much of a pasta eater kind of thing. 
um, so I, I paid more attention to that and then realized, okay, I'm still not hundred percent what's going on. Uh, so I went to before keto even became the buzzword it's been around for hundreds of years, but before it became a buzzword recently, um, you know, eight years ago, I, I was keto vegetarian. I had, um, so there, the, the, the keto thing was what I was, I was heading towards and, um, didn't know it was called that at the time, but I upped the fat versus, uh, the carbs. And that's when I started doing it that way instead. And I noticed that there was a huge change and healing. And then it was even, um, honing in on certain things that I was eating in that realm of keto vegetarian that I realized I was having sensitivities to as well. So I did a lot of, um, you know, um, I started with the gaps, tried to eliminate everything and start adding things back in. I still had some reactions to sensitivities to some things, but I picked the things that I didn't have a major reaction to. And that's what I stuck with, unfortunately. And, um, and so you, just lived that way. Yeah. So, so you started as a, just a, you were a vegetarian for a while yeah, yeah. and then you went to, uh, keto is yeah. Right? Vegetarian keto. Yep. Vegetarian keto. Okay. Yeah. And then you went from there to, to actually now carnivore. carnivore. Okay. Yeah. And so that eight year period of being vegetarian keto was trial and error, finding what worked, what didn't work and doing the, what I thought was the biggest elimination of all eliminations, which was the gaps diet. So you really just start with bone broth. Right. Um, so I started there and adding things back in that way. Maybe um, explain uh, the, uh, yeah. for people how to go. I actually talked about this on, on one of my micro podcasts where I just talked for like five, 10 minutes, but I talked a little bit about elimination diets. Maybe yeah. just explain that to people, how they can go about that. Yeah. And there's a couple of different ways of doing that. And I, I look at um, what I'm doing now, the elimination of all eliminations as well. Um, so the there's carnivore. a couple of ways of, yeah, yeah carnivore. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's really elimination of all the ultimate elimination diet. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> but the gaps, the way that I did that one um, is I did a couple of weeks on just bone broth and um, got my body to basically detox everything else. Um, mm but still have some nutrients. I'm not a big believer in just doing water for a detox um, mm. or just juicing. I'm not a big believer in that. Um, so I, I decided I was going to do it with the bone broth instead. So you and almost that, did like a fasting bone broth. Exactly. Like, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Yeah. Which is, I, I, I'm a big faster, big believer in it. Um, yes, and uh, yeah, that is one way of doing it is just, you know, having bone broth, uh, cause you get a ton of, you know, nutrients from that and your and electrolytes as well. Right. Absolutely. And on top of that, I'm an athlete, right? So at the time I was doing CrossFit five times a day, uh, five times a week, excuse me. I was <laughs> running. Um, yeah. I was also a rock climber and an ice climber, uh, yeah. a surfer, you know, like, so I was constantly doing something seven days a week. So to just do it on water would not have been healthy. And so, so yeah. you did the bone broth and then did you just add in, um, you slowly added in, 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 you know, different foods just to see how it would yeah. affect your body. Absolutely. And they yeah. say to start with eggs uh, they say to start with egg whites. And I always had a reaction to eggs, um, for most, most of my life mm -hmm. I had them. And so I was kind of nervous to do that, but I started with the egg white and yeah, I did have a little bit of a reaction. Then I did the egg yolks, had a little bit of a reaction. So it came down to, oh, and then squashes, they wanted you to add squashes. And um, so, you know, like slowly adding things in that way. And mm -hmm. um, I found that no matter what kind of fruit I had, I had a reaction to. And the one thing that we have to, to pay attention to as well is that it could take three to four days for a symptom to show up. So it's not like I was adding these things in all at once and all the time, this was right. a long process. So it wasn't something that, um, that I was, it, that I was taking care of within a couple months. It was a long process. I want to say about eight, eight to 10 months oh, of wow. adding things back in. So it wasn't is quick. one way to add them back in, like, so you eliminated everything with, and just did bone broth for, yep. uh, uh, I don't know how long you did that for. Um, I did a two weeks of just bone broth, nothing more. Mm -hmm. Another way could be just taking stuff out, right? Like yep. you have your normal diet, you say, okay, I'm going to take out grains. Yep. 
And then maybe after that, I'll take out dairy and just see how you react that way. That's another way Correct. of doing it. So if you don't, just don't want to go cold turkey, <laughs> just, like yeah, I did. Yeah, cold turkey and just do <laughs> bone broth. But it's a great I, way to yeah. have your body heal, right? If you, Absolutely. you know, any type of fasting I always talk about. Yeah. I agree with that. And I think we should all be doing some kind of, I don't like calling it intermittent fasting. I like to call it intuitive eating, but I think we yes. should always be doing something like that for sure. Um, I just, cause we eat too much and there's just too much, to, you know, available to us. We have to let the body, you know, get rid of what we've already ingested. And if we're constantly eating, we can't do that. So yeah. I think I'm a big believer in that too. So I but think What's However, your eating? I'm sorry. What's your eating schedule like now? Yeah. Well, I just came off a big race, um, oh, yeah. a 17 day race. So mine's a little bit different right now, but normally it would be, you know, I, I don't, I stop eating at six o'clock at night. Um, I'm a big believer in following the circadian rhythm. Like right now it's light until nine o'clock at night. So, you know, if I'm hungry at any point before then it's okay, but I, I'm a big believer in following our natural circadian rhythm. And usually about three o'clock is when our body wants to start shutting down, getting ready for bed. Um, so I try and, and not eat too much further past that. If I can help it right now, it's I'm eating whenever my belly grumbles. Mm -hmm. And so it's been quite a journey as far as that, that race went, but for the most part, I only eat twice a day. Um, and it's usually, you know, giving myself that 18 hour window before I eat my breakfast and it works out perfect because I, I work out in the morning when I work, when I wake up and I get all my stuff done in the morning before right. that. And so I usually don't eat before 10, 11 o'clock. So right now it's 10 o'clock. My time, this is usually about the time when my belly starts to grumble mm -hmm. and wants to eat. And then I don't eat again until probably, you know, like three, four the latest six. Um, but I don't eat that second meal until my belly grumbles again. And you're eating, um, simply meat. Yeah. Anything just, any, meat. just meat. <laughs> just now meat. you've been doing it. I thought I saw on your website. Is it, have you been carnivore for 580 days? It might be more than that. It's, it's more than that now. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually did it yesterday because through the race, I wasn't counting, but normally I would just do a, a count every day. So I'm at 665 days. Um, is what I'm at for carnivore. And just so people know, why don't you maybe explain what carnivore is? Yeah. And, um, I, yeah. <laughs> so up until before my race, um, what I look at, cause there's different ways to do all kinds of dietary theories, right? There's a, there's a, I always say there's a clean way to do it. There's a dirty way to do it. Um, there's a clean way to do carnivore. There's a dirty way to do it and dirty meaning that for me, when I went carnivore, I wanted it all to be humanely raised. I wanted it to be healthy. I don't want antibiotics. I don't want hormones. I don't want any of that stuff. I mean, those are the very reasons why we have a lot of gut issues and a lot of health problems is because of that stuff. So mm -hmm. my thing was, I want to support local farms if I'm going to do it. Luckily, I have three local farms here, but I mm -hmm. also supplement with a couple of other online places that I could do like eat nose to tail.org is one and white oak pastures, which is down in Georgia. I like, so I have different places to pull from if my sources here are running low, um, which has happened since COVID, you know, right. there's been a lot of things that have kind of disrupted the, the flow of things. So, so, so you do nose to tail. So you do organ meats. Yeah. Um, are you adding, any type, anything else? Like I know, like, for example, like Paul Saladino's added in like some fruit and honey. Yeah. You, you tried any of that or you just, I have tried. Um, I, one of my sponsors is NutriSense, which is the continuous glucose monitor okay. that we can have. And I did a little bit of experimenting with that because like, again, I'm an athlete, right? So I'm able to, um, not have those things, those carbs, because I don't have my heart rate above a certain percent or, or beat per minute that keeps me in aerobic. So I'm just fat burning. So my body can just function up just fat. I don't need carbs. I don't need sugar. Um, one, one of the races that I have coming up in August, I will be an anaerobic. I will be straight out sugar burner. So I need to start adding something in, whether it's sweet potatoes, something that's a lesser of, of an issue. Um, so I did some experiments with that. So I did some sweet potato and I did some honey and I did some coconut sugar. Mm. And what I found was quite interesting. Um, the sweet potatoes, my insulin spiked through the roof, my glucose spiked through the roof. Um, but it came back down and that's what we want to see. Is right. it coming back down quickly? 
um, the sugar, as far as the coconut sugar and the honey went, I didn't see much change in my, in my glucose. So those would be the two things that I would probably start to incorporate are those two things. Those are easy to bring on the trail and to on, on a bike ride. So that might be my source of carbs and sugar. Um, when I do that, I just need to do a little bit more experimenting with that. But for the most part, no, I haven't done any of that stuff. It's just been strictly, um, meat. And for me, like organ meats were hard to eat. So I found, um, a supplement company that is just straight up mm -hmm. organ meats, nothing else. And so I've been adding, using that instead. Um, I tried cooking the organ meats. I'm just not good at it. <laughs> my, my, we actually, I've done, my wife is always open to trying things. And so she made, we made bison liver Ooh, uh, the other day and yeah, it came out it came out really good. I can send you the recipe. I mean, I would love that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of with the liver, it's like liver and onions, right? I think like my grandparents yeah. ate it back in the day yeah. and, and, uh, but it came out good. I mean, I will say liver is a tough, it's like a tougher, um, uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's the, it's a tougher substance, yeah. <laughs> but once you get over that, it's a little, you know, it's, it's not like cutting into a filet, <laughs> right? <laughs> once you get over that, it's, it's actually not bad. It's just like a tougher substance, I would say. Um, yeah. The uh, texture is definitely. the texture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I didn't mind the taste at all. Um, so you're breaking your fast with like ribeye, huh? Do you don't eat, you don't eat eggs or anything. Do you? I do now. I'm oh, able to now. I okay. don't have, uh, since I started, I think it was probably, I I'll have to look back at my notes, but I believe it was 30 days in of just me. I was able to start having some eggs. Eggs. Um, yeah. So I do a lot of eggs. I do a lot of ribeye. I do a lot of flank steaks, like mm. the fattier cuts of meat is what I'll do. But yeah, ribeyes are my favorite. Me too. Oh, do you make, those. um, do you ever try making beef jerky? Yes, actually I do. And I actually, that's how I get my organ meats in. If I'm going to eat them instead of using supplements is okay. I, I have a meat grinder and I grind up the meat, um, with, with organ meats and oh. make jerky that way. And it's really good. Sorry. My dog is gnawing on my desk. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. It's always good. But we'll keep it. recording. Whatever. Yeah. That's totally fine. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, yeah. So maybe explain to people, you know, carnivore obviously is very, uh, exclusive to just obviously meats and maybe some eggs. Yep. What caught it? Did you find that the veggies, you know, the anti-nutrients in vegetables and even nuts and seeds and stuff, did that, did you find that that caused a lot of issues for you? It did. Like uh, what I noticed was, um, when I went keto vegetarian, I felt a lot better. I got the mental clarity, but there was still like that little piece missing that I didn't feel a hundred percent and I couldn't pinpoint what it was. Mm -hmm. And so I had been doing a lot of research, uh, for, it was about eight months on the carnivore. And, um, I, I was like, oh, you know, it's hard for me because of the meat and the texture. So I was like, it's hard for me to grasp that, to do it myself. And I normally don't ask my clients to do things that I haven't done. And I had a handful of clients, same thing that, you know, when I put them on keto or paleo, they got a hundred, you know, they got a lot better, but not a hundred percent better. There was still some underlying inflammatory issues. So that's why I found carnivore and I was doing research on that. So I started putting some of my clients on that and believe it or not, my daughter. Um, so she had the um, diverticulosis. So it started okay. helping her with that. It also started helping her with her depression and her anxiety. Mm. Um, and she had had those issues since she was, you know, a teenager. Um, and here she is now, you know, she just turned 31 at the time when we put her on it, she was 29. So, um, it was just amazing to see the huge difference that, that happened in her, uh, and my clients, you know, so I was like, okay, there is definitely something to this. I need to do it. If I'm going to have my clients do it, I need to do it. So I just set out to do it for 30 days. And here we are, you know, 650, 60 days later. Um, you know, so I think that, it's definitely um, not for everyone. I wouldn't put everybody on it. Um, I would highly recommend getting help doing it if you're going to do it. Um, there are there are people out there that eat just ribeye and and um, eggs, and that's 
okay for them. They've done, they've done it for 15 some odd years. Um, for me, I believe just because of the extent that I am an athlete, I need more than just that. Um, so that's why I incorporate the organ meats. And I think that that's important. I mean, if you look at our ancestors, they ate the whole animal. They didn't eat just the meat. So I think it's, a, there's something to be said about that. Yeah, it's, it is amazing. You hear these stories. I had Dr. Uh, Judy Troy on. Yeah. And how, how, how healing, you know, your diet can be, I think people have to just open their minds to trying it. I mean, you can always go back to what you've done. Right. And yeah, yeah. I mean, with her situation as well, it was, it was a, a mental health issue as well. And that helped heal when she, when she went to carnivore. And like you said, it might not be for everybody, but if you're having these issues and, uh, you know, start with food, right. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's all connected. I mean, we learned about that in IIN that, you know, you can't, you can't do a dietary change and not look at other things in your life. You know, um, I know that it all is connected in the way that it helps with my mindset change, you know, working on meditating and whatever that is for people. Is it walking outside and your bare feet in grounding yourself that way? That's meditation for some people. Is it actually, you know, finding spirituality through a church? You know, some people feel that that is more of a meditation for them Um, or reading something like a Jordan Peterson book that is about, you know, um, how to live a a better life as far as being a better person. You know, there's all kinds of forms of, of spirituality, but that's a big missing link that we have because we're always on our phones. We're always in front of the computer. We always have some kind of outside stimulus. Um, So I think when you make those kind of changes to the way that you eat, it actually helps with a lot of other areas in your life as well. Um, so more movement, spirituality, kind of thing, what brings you joy, you know, um, social aspects of things, like what we struggle with right now because of what's going on in this world, um, less connection, human connection. Um, you know, so I think that you can't do one thing without looking at the others as well. There's no doubt. I mean, I always say if you're struggling, especially like with sleep, you know, a lot of the other stuff um, doesn't really matter per se. I mean, not that it doesn't matter, but like you want to start with sleep and what I actually, last night I did a meditation. I meditate, I did a sleep meditation before I went to bed and I've been doing, I've been meditating in the evenings and just testing it out. I'm not, you know, even just 10 minutes, this one was 20 minutes. And, and I can, I can tell you this, I, I, I'm a good sleeper. I, I actually felt like I slept even better. Really? Yeah. I've not done it in the evening. I wonder, I mean, that would be something to test. I've always done it when I first woke up in the morning, but okay. that would be a great, cause I've had a hard time sleeping lately just because of, you know, coming off in the high from the race that I did. Right. Um, it's been almost a week. Actually it is a week. Today's a week that I've finished. And last night and the night prior were the two nights that I finally got a full night's sleep. So that's definitely something to look into. Was it like a breathing exercise you did or an actual listening, an audio one? It was, it was audio and actually I, I, it was through Peloton, uh, but oh, there's so many great apps. Great. I know uh, my sister's gotten into meditation and there's like plenty of a meditation lot. apps if you want like a guided yeah. one, but starts, start with like a five or 10 minute one. I like to do it in the evening, especially if, if you're looking to, you know, just help your sleep and, and get, yeah. get to bed. It, I really found that it helped. So that's awesome. Cause I, I agree with you on that too, though. You can eat as clean as you want and you can exercise as good as you want, as much as you want, but if you're not sleeping, it's not going to matter. Right. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in sleep is definitely priority for sure. Yep. What, what's your morning routine? You were saying you meditate. What else? I'm a big morning yeah. routine guy. <laughs> you are. I love that. Yeah. And I love calling them rituals, right? Because it also gives you that ability to have a little bit of flexibility because there's that that um, guilt aspect if you don't follow, like if you don't have the rigidity. And Mm -hmm. so I like to call it a ritual um, for that reason. But Mm -hmm. I I usually wake up at four and I go into another room um, and I actually listen to uh, a meditation that was made for me. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm all about that rapid transformation therapy. And um, basically it's, it's 
hypnotherapy basically is what it is. And it puts you in that theta state and it works with the, um, you know, your subconscious mind and it kind of reprograms that kind of stuff. What I found working with clients, and I'm sure you have experienced too, there's always that little, little missing link that I always call the upper limiting factor where we're always, you know, trying to better ourselves. And then all of a sudden we get knocked down two notches. And a lot of it is because of our upper limiting beliefs that we have. And so this kind of works with that. And basically tells you you are enough. And that's one of the things that we don't believe in a lot is our self worth. And this is one of the things that I've been working on for about a year. And um, I've been listening to this meditation for a year. Mm. I notice the days that I don't listen to it, that my the way I talk to myself is not so kind. So I make sure I do it every day. It's about 20, 25 minutes. And then um, I, after that, when she counts down, it wakes me up. I automatically just kind of wake up and I start to journal. So I write a lot of things of, I start my day with what I'm grateful for. And I do it for things in my life, but I also do it about myself because it's easy to give gratitude to other people, but not ourselves. And so I try and do that every day, at least list three things and um, they can't be the same. So they always have to be different. I noticed that I have a gratitude journal. I've been doing that. And I oh, keep going, but you know, yeah, I, you keep going back to the same things, but you got to get, you know, there's a lot more things, even just the little things, you know, absolutely being able to get up and go for a walk. Some people, exactly. you know, things like and that. your hands, your eyes, you right. know, being able to see things, smell things, you know, like, so they're, they don't have to be huge. They, like you said, the little things we need to start being grateful for. Um, so, so I love after, doing that. Okay. So after the gratitude journal, yep. then what? after that, um, I end up going downstairs and getting my husband ready for work. So like he'll, he goes off to work and I love setting him off on the same level as I did. I'm a big believer in starting nice and calm. And if you start your day that way, your whole day is going to be that way. You mean getting up and looking at your cell phone right away is not the way to go. <laughs> it's not the way to go. And I've right. fallen into that these mm. past few months. I've fallen into that because of the race that I was doing. Um, so I'm starting to break myself of that now. Um, yeah. So it's getting back into, I mean, it's easy to fall into that habit. Uh, the people that I was working with was overseas. They're in the UK. So when I wake up at four, it's nine o'clock their time. And I've got a whole list of messages of things that I need to do that day. And so I was like constantly scrolling through or things that they needed. Um, so now it's to unlearn that um, mm. is something that I'm, I'm doing again. And I wanted him to start his day the same way. So I'll go down, I'll make him breakfast. I'll make him coffee. I'll sit with him before he goes off to work. So he starts his day nice and calm because he sees patients all day. He has to be spot on. And so, you know, for him to start his day nice and calm and not rushing around and panicking to get things done is, is huge for me um, to, to offer him as well. And so once he leaves, that's when I do my working out, my cardio, my weights and all that. And then I don't see clients before 11 o'clock. I don't do any of that before 11. Cause if I can't be there for myself, I can't be there for them a hundred percent. So yeah, I need to make great. time for myself and making time for yourself. And you know, you're getting up at four. I always tell people, even if it's just getting up a half hour earlier than you're used Absolutely. to. Absolutely, Start somewhere. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> for I would sure. say even five minutes, all you need is five minutes to start. And then that five minutes will grow. Once you realize right. how important it is and how good you feel, it grows. Right. Yeah. And, uh, talk about the race. I, I, I know we were trying to book this and I think you were in the midst of it. So <laughs> yes, I was. on your website, it's my race across America. It's 40, what was it? 4,200 miles. Yeah. And, yeah, and, so, and what, what was it for? So, um, there's a couple of, of races that we can do that, that we have here in the United States. It's the longest race. First off, uh, there's the race across America and then there's the trans American bike race. So one starts in California, one starts in Astoria, Oregon. And I did the one that was in Astoria, Oregon. The reason why I did it was because it was self-supported. You can't have any vans. You can't have any help. Whatever, whatever's available for all racers you can have, basically. And um, if it's not available for everyone, you can't do it or else you get qual- disqualified from the race. So if someone were to, like I'm pedaling along, someone to come out and say, hey, I have two bunk beds. Do you want to stay? kind of thing. You can't do that unless all hundred of the racers or however many are out there can sleep in the same place. So those are the, that's what that means by being self-supported. So Um, you started in Oregon, you said? 
that's where if you were to do it in real life. So what happened was I did it virtually instead okay. of in real life. And the platform that I used, you're able to upload GPX files, the actual road and ride the actual road. Got it. Uh, the smart trainer that I have um, with these GPX files, it picks up gradient and it picks up slope on the road. It picks up all of that stuff. So my smart trainer adjusts the resistance to that. Oh, so if I'm cool. going up over the Rockies, I'm hitting the same kind of slope as somebody who's out there. The only difference is, is I don't have the weather. I'm, I don't have the inclement weather sure. that I'm facing that they have. Um, so I had both of them had their pros and cons. And the reason why I did it virtually was because I wasn't able to get bike parts in enough time. And I wasn't able to even get a new bike because mm. of everybody wants to be outside right now. Yeah. And you know, so everything is just in sh such shortage that I, I was like, okay, I didn't want a chance not having the equipment. So I just decided in February when I got the email from the, the we call it T, um, Tabor for short. So Trans American Bike Race, we call it Tabor for short. But um, when I got the email from them, they were not sure if it was a definite yet. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to do this. I want to do this. It took me a year to train. I want it. I'm going to do it. And so, mm -hmm that's when I ended up doing it for deciding to do it virtually. They ended up doing it in real life, which was great. Mm. Um, I'm kind of bummed that I didn't get to do it, but it's always going to be there. I could mm -hmm. probably do it next year. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to do it carnivore and prove to every, not everybody, I shouldn't say it that way. I know that our bodies don't need carbs. I haven't had carbs in eight years. I haven't had sugar in eight years. I know we can do it without. Um, so I did it. I, I wanted to do it that way. And I also wanted to raise awareness for myocytosis. And that is, um, you know, where you lose loss of your muscle. And one of the guys that I was training with, he lost his wife two years ago to that. And, um, and so it really meant a lot to me to be able to raise awareness. He wasn't even about raising money. He just wanted awareness because him and his wife didn't have that awareness when they were going through it. And he wished he had because it would have made her life so much easier. Um, I shouldn't say easier. It would have just been less painful for her if they had that, um, the knowledge and the awareness of it. So that was kind of the approach we were coming from is, is raising that awareness. And, um, and it was actually really um, an eye opener for me because it's all about, you know, pushing yourself to that limit. And she, she did that before she passed away. She made such an impact of always being happy. I mean, it's stuff that you and I teach our clients, you know, she was always looking for better ways to approach her situation and making it a positive situation. And um, she was very inspiring. And I feel like I've known her, I knew her through him and her story and just following her. She has a beautiful page, um, Facebook page. So I was able to go through that and something that I could relate to, um, as far as what she was trying to teach her followers. And, um, I think her and I would have been best friends if she was still alive. And, uh, so that really meant a lot to me to help raise awareness for that. Mm -hmm. So for every mile that I did, I wanted to raise a dollar. And so that was kind of the awareness behind all of that, um, you know, 4,200 miles and, um, and to do it carnivore, knowing that you could do it healthy instead of, eating, we call it Gation food, gas station food, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know? Um, so that, that was huge in of itself. And my, I figured since I was going to do it virtually, I wanted to have a goal. If I was going to do out in, in real life, I was just going to go and do it. I, I wasn't going to try and beat any record. Um, but being home, I wanted to have a goal because I could be, I could probably still be pedaling. I mm -hmm. probably would have, you know, hundred miles a day, whatever, you know, kind of thing. How many miles did you do a day? Um, I ended up doing the first day I did a hundred, uh, 280 a day, uh, that wow. first day. Um, and then I ended up going down to, um, 230 is what I averaged 230, 240 right around mm. there. Wow. That's amazing. So, and I wanted to beat the current woman's record and, um, which was 18 days, 10 minutes. And I did, I did it in 17 days, 14 hours, wow. 32 minutes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We didn't think it was going to happen um, because the first day when I did the 280 miles, we thought we were going to actually break the record, like really smash it. Uh, if I had kept going at that rate, I would have been 15 days. Um, right. But with the heat wave that we had and. Um, oh, you did it outside? 
I know I did it inside and we don't have AC in our house. Um, oh. but we had, a, we had, it was like 90 degree days and over 80% humidity. Wow. Um, and I was on the top floor, which didn't make it any better. How um, do you sleep in that? <laughs> oh, it was hot. Yeah. It was hard. Um, I, I, I had a couple of instances. My daughter actually literally saved my life twice because of it. She was um, recruited as my team to have be the eyes for them because they were overseas. They can't see me. They don't know, you know, what's going on. But uh, she came to see me. I couldn't swallow anything on the first day because it was just so I had the fans on because it was so hot. Mm. And anytime I ate something, I would literally choke. And so I stopped eating and I burn 10,000 calories a day. And as we both know, it's not calories in calories out, but when you're doing something that extreme, it is. Mm. And so, um, I was depleted that, that second day, uh, because I couldn't eat anything wow. and I was still doing all that high mileage. Um, so she ended up, her and her husband ended up buying an AC unit, putting it in that room. <laughs> for me. Probably smart. <laughs> yeah. Cause I ended up having heat exhaustion too. It was, it was crazy, you know, like, so being depleted, having heat exhaustion, you don't have that right mental awareness. Um, so yeah, it ended up being, we didn't think I was going to finish. Um, a lot of people didn't think I was going to finish, but I, I was able, it was early enough in the, in the race and I wasn't as sleep deprived. Mm as had it been later in the race, I just said, okay, what does my body need? It needs sleep and it needs to be repaired. So I just told the team, I was like, okay, I am going to cut out the last section. I'm going to sleep four hours, not two hours. I'm going to sleep four hours Mm -hmm. and I'm going to heal my body. And they, I was like, it's not about breaking this record anymore. It's about getting it done, but in a healthy way. And they were very, very supportive and helpful in that. And so, um, but I still ended up beating the record. It just wasn't going to be 15 days. It just ended Mm. up being 17 that I had planned to do to begin with. (laughs) Wow. Very impressive. It was awesome. It was awesome. And we're, and people can learn about that on your website, right? What's so people know what's best place to reach you on your. Yeah. So it's K eight for wellness. So it's the letter K, the number eight, the number four wellness.com. Um, and I also have a YouTube under the same thing. And I, there's some YouTube videos on there of the race. What was really cool is we did it virtual and um, we were able to live stream it. So we had a lot of big, huge thought leaders doing a lot of, I would pre inter um, pre-recorded the interviews with them. So I had like Dr. Um, Phil Maffetone and Mark Allen, who's six time Ironman finisher, huge um, in the fitness world. And then I also had Dr. Sean Baker, um, carnivore, <laughs> he was in there. Um, we had, you know, Autumn Smith, who talks a lot about the mental health and food and how that's related. She's paleo Valley. So she was on there talking about that stuff. Um, so we had a lot of really amazing guest speakers too to offer knowledge as well. Like, why am I doing carnivore, which is huge to a lot of people. They're like, why is she eating just meat kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Um, so it just kind of gave them, I had all perspectives of, I so I had paleo, I had keto because I had Brad Kearns on there too. who's mm-hmm. a good friend of mine. Um, so I had, you know, like all levels of how you could eat and what would be a healthy way to do that. The only thing I didn't have was vegetarian, uh, because I'm a big believer we need meat. Um, I, I found that out myself. Um, you know, so I think that, um, that's the only dietary theory I didn't cover. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you see yourself adding it ever adding back anything? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've been experimenting over these 600 days of just having a bite here and there and then waiting. And I've had, it used to be almost instantaneous, you know, like migraine, bloody noses, rashes, really? no. hives. It's not that way anymore. It takes a couple of days, but it's usually now just an, like a, a really upset stomach or a headache. It has nothing to do with any. So I know I'm healing. Um, so yeah, definitely. I don't think I'll ever have sugar again or carbs. I mean, I'm a big believer that those are two of the culprits, two of the three. And I think the other one is definitely the seed oils. Um, so, you know, having those again, I'll never do that again, but I I will definitely add in some vegetables and without a doubt I do, um, occasionally. So nothing refined, obviously nothing refined, but you might add in some, some veggies. Yep. Yeah, definitely veggies without a doubt. Yeah. I think that we do need some, um, 
you know, we used them as our ancestors used them as a fill in when things were scarce. And I would love to be able to cycle through those, you know, um, yeah. just have a little bit of a variety. <laughs> yeah. So one question I ask all my guests at the end is uh, what's, what would be one tip you'd give someone who, you know, maybe they're in their fifties and sixties and they're trying to get their body back to what it once was back, you know, maybe when they're in their twenties and thirties. Uh, I know there's probably a lot of tips, but what would be one tip maybe you'd give that person? Oh, see, that's really, it's hard. You're right. There's a lot. Um, I, know. I think even, even in, in our fifties, there's a, one of the things, I mean, obviously sleep is huge, but one thing is water. We don't drink enough water. I've noticed that in all stages of our life. And if working with people, I see it too. Um, that's the first thing that we let go is the amount of water that we drink. It's so underrated. Um, and it's something that gives you a lot of energy, just drinking enough water. People don't even realize it. They're like, Oh, and it helps with inflammation. It helps flush out a lot of that stuff too. So, you know, finding water, um, you know, like a routine around water each day for me, it's getting it ready. If I don't get it ready, I call it water prepping. If I don't do that in the morning, I don't drink enough. It's easy to forget. It's easy right. to let go. So I think water is huge. Um, it's also satiating, it right? Is. Yeah. You know, if you, th- I always say, if you think you're hungry, Maybe you should drink some water and see how you feel after that. Because they're one and the same receptors, right? We feel when we are thirsty, we feel hungry. That's the first thing to, that we feel when it's really probably hunger. Absolutely. Because we don't have, a lot of us can't produce that ghrelin and our, and that ghrelin is what makes our belly grumble. And when Mm -hmm. we eat carbs and we eat sugar, we don't have the ability to make that ghrelin. So it comes across as, you know, um, like when we some people like, Oh, maybe I'm, I'm hungry. It's like that empty feeling. It's not really a grumble mm-hmm. kind of thing. So it's usually, it's usually thirsty. thirsty yeah. <laughs> We're usually thirsty. Yeah. You, with your water, do you put electrolytes in it or do you I do salt? Okay. Yeah, I do. Um, because I'm a big believer in that stuff too. Um, you know, with the minerals and stuff. Absolutely. Um, I, some days I use more than others, you know, we're going through this huge heat wave. I'm constantly sweating. So I'll have a little more, but for the most part, um, I usually just use, um, a packet, two packets a day, and it has sodium, potassium, magnesium in it. Those and nothing else. I don't do anything that has stevia or anything like that in it. Okay. It's unflavored. Well, this was great, Kate. We had a few interruptions from my That's dogs, okay. but other than that, we made it <laughs> hey. through. Yeah. Life happens. That's all right. We right. all have animals. We know right. what that's like. <laughs> yeah. We have animals who like the bug at squirrels. That's so, right. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. Um, awesome. But I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. And telling everyone your story. And um, yeah, uh, I, I hope we'll hopefully we'll be in touch down the road. And um, Absolutely. thanks again so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Hey, Get Lean, Eat Clean Nation. Are you a man between the ages of 40 and 60 years old looking to lose inches around your waist, have significantly more energy throughout the day, and gain muscle, all while minimizing the risk of injuries? Well, I'm looking for three to five people to work one-on-one with in my Fat Burner Blueprint Signature Program, which I've developed by utilizing my 15 years experience in the health and fitness space. This program is designed specifically for those committed to making serious progress towards our health goals over the next six months. We will focus on sleep, stress, nutrition, meal timing, and building lean muscle. If this sounds like a fit for you, email me at brian at briangrin.com with the subject line blueprint. That's brian at briangrin.com with the subject line blueprint. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.